welcome to our, our Sunday night worship service here at Crescent Beach. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. All right? Everybody's finding their seats. Okay. Not many announcements, so uh, we'll have prayer and then we'll get started tonight. And we'll be back in Genesis 49. Okay, so let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for what you have allowed us to be involved with today. Worship, praise, and I pray, Lord, that it brought honor and glory to you and your name. I pray you were pleased, Lord, what you heard and saw this morning. Not so much in the performance, but in the heart of each one of us. Tonight, as we return, God, we want to look back into your word. We want to lift our voices in song. And God, we want to continue to give you on this day, your day, the first day of the week, praise and honor and glory. Thank you for being our king, our savior, and our soon returning redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Barry. Hey, good evening. Good evening. This song, first song we're going to sing this evening, Here I Am to Worship, written by Tim Hughes, who is a you know, tremendous songwriter. His father was a pastor, and what a great um, song talks about, here we are to worship God. So let's stand together and sing that, Here I Am to Worship. Great things he 
hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. other like we do sometime in the evening then we're going to come back and sing the rest of this song and then one other song so greet those around you tonight <laughs>
as his lovely name and that's the reason why i love him so yes jesus is the sweetest name i know you may be seen genesis chapter 49 again tonight verses 5 through 7 so we continue uh with Simeon and Levi. And as you find your place, I want us to do one thing. We're just singing a beautiful song about Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Now, I want us to say softly, I want you to say the name of Jesus. Okay? Ready? One, two, three. Jesus. All right? Now a little bit louder. One, two, three. Jesus. Isn't that sweet? Imagine Mary in the garden thinking that it's over. She's worried about Jesus. She wanted to come back to the tomb. And so she's crying, and the Bible says she's crying so hard, she's weeping. And then all of a sudden, there's someone walking behind her, and she thought it was the gardener. Remember? And he says, what are you doing? She says, I've, I've come to look for Jesus. And then what did he do? He called her by her name. He said, Mary. That was it. He knows your name. He knows your name. He knows your name. Don't forget that. He knows us. Okay? One, two, three. Jesus. Sweetest name I know. By the way, there's so much power in that name. The Bible says that just at the mention of his name, the devils tremble and do what? Flee. But we don't, we don't run away from him, do we? No, we run to him. Genesis chapter 49, verses 5 through 7. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Now, this is Jacob. He's talking to his sons. This is the next two in line. We've already talked about Reuben. That was last week. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter and enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man... And in their self-will, they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pause just for a moment. Father, now we ask for that divine illumination that we need tonight. It's been a busy day. Lord, and... If we're not careful in our minds, we will start planning for next week, what we're going to do tomorrow, what we need to do, doctor's visits, grocery shopping, checking on people. Lord, help us, help us to fight that good fight, to put that off until this hour is over because we need to concentrate on what you have for us, what you want us to hear tonight from your word. Lord, may we not only hear it, but may we see it in our own lives this week as we flesh out the truths that we'll hear tonight. Thank you for this time we can be together. Thank you, Lord, that we as a church body, Lord, this is a special time as we gather around the Word of God together. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We talked this morning about the fact that from the grave of forgotten memories, now Simeon and Levi, their past is about to be resurrected. And Jacob, their father, is going to do it. Remember, it was 40 three years ago that they did something that was horrible. Their sister Donna, and you remember all this, their sister Donna was raped by a young prince from Shechem. And so they, in revenge, went and made a deal with them. And here's the treachery, because they were using their religion, their faith, if you please. They said, okay, if you want to marry our sister, whom you have harmed, then everybody in the clan here in the group needs to be circumcised. And they agreed to that. So a few days later, after the circumcision, while they were still healing up, they came in and they slaughtered the whole group of the men, all the men. And they took the women and the children, they kidnapped them and took them as captives. They took all of their, everything they owned, they ransacked the houses, they did a horrendous thing. And Jacob, all, the best that he could do at that time, because he was still growing in his faith, is that he just reprimanded them. That's all he did. But here's what you have to understand. Even though we receive a reprimand, even though somebody says, you know, what you did wasn't right and that was wrong, you've got to understand, you still have to answer to God. 
You still have to answer for that. And you, you, there's two things about that. I just want to say two things. Number one, if we would be cognizant of that, that whatever we say or do, we have to answer for it. Maybe it'll slow us down some so we won't sin as much. I mean, that makes sense, you know? Now, when I was growing up, I thought, I better not do that because my dad finds out I'm in trouble. Okay? You say, well, were you, you worried about your dad? Well, then I was, but now I'm worried about my father in heaven. Not worried that he's going to find me and see me. No, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's the fact that he knows what I'm doing. He knows why I did it. And that's just something else. And I don't want to do anything, anything to hurt the name of Jesus. And that, and that should be our mindset. You say, well, do you? Oh, yeah. I still mess up and say stupid stuff and, and then lazy and just all kinds. But then I come back and, and, you know, and the one thing, what was the difference between David and Saul? Saul never learned how to repent. Talking about King Saul. David did. You say, well, it's a good thing. Oh, man, he had, he had stuff coming on. You say, well, I, I wasn't as bad as David. Your sin still called Jesus to die on the cross, so don't forget that. So don't think we're in competition or, well, I'm not as bad as he was. We're all bad. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I mentioned this. I want to mention it again tonight. Jacob, dis he's, he's going to distance himself publicly from his sons. You say, well, he's on his deathbed. I'm not sure that he didn't already do this in his life the last 43 years. He distances himself from his sons because of the evil that they did. We must be mindful of defending our children and excusing their sins. We talked about this. Looking the other way is an offense to God and is harmful to our children and our grandchildren. Your children ought to be important to you, but the reputation of God ought to be far more important. We are unfaithful to their souls. Listen, if we make excuses for them, this is James Montgomery Boyce. <coughs> We are unfaithful to their souls if we make excuses for them. This leads them to believe that they stand in little need of God's forgiveness. And this is why. He writes, if dad and mom says it's okay, then God must be okay with it too because dad and mom are supposed to do what's right with God. Matthew Henry said, we ought carefully to distinguish between the sinner and the sin so as not to love the sin for the sake of the person nor to hate the person for the sake of the sin. Now, he's not double-talking here, not double-speak. What he's saying is we have to be careful. Okay, I, I, I love you so much, and what you did was wrong, but I love you, and so I'm, I'm, I don't want to hurt you, and, and this, we have to be careful. I don't want to push you away. I don't want to you know, come railing down on you, and I don't want you to think I'm some legalist. No, because then you have the other side of it, where it says, nor are we to hate the person for the sake of their sin. I can't believe you did that. I'm done with you. I just, I'm just, no, no, no. It kind of sounds like the church at Corinth. Church at Corinth, they always went to one extreme or the other. They were either all forgiving and just, you know, went outside the boundaries of grace or else they were so legalistic they just threw the guy out of the church. Neither one of those works. But we must not allow ourselves to let our emotions control the circumstances. We have to stay with the objective truth of God. Not the subjective truth, but the objective truth. If we read the account, and I want to read this again, if we read the account of Jesus and his act of obedience to the Father and deliberately going to the cross, if we read that subjectively or emotionally, then we will miss the whole divine point of the atonement. Why did he go to the cross? To pay our sin debt in full. That was God's will for his life. You say, yeah, but it was so horrible. And I mean, think about you know, the beatings and think about all that he did. And every, he was misunderstood and all of that. That was God's will for his life. But if we look, look at it subjectively, you remember what Peter said to him? He said, Jesus said, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to be handed over to the authorities. and They're going to take my life. Peter said, I'll fight for you. I will die for you. I will go to jail for you. And what did, what did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Satan didn't want him to go to the cross. That was God's will. So if we let our emotions come in, when it comes to our children, when it comes to our friends, even our spouses, when it comes to that, and either you know, we're going to honor God, we're going to do it God's way, or we're just going to say, well, you know, you know, sh you know I, I just love you too much to say anything. We're, we're not doing them any good. Why? Because sin has consequences, and we know that. 
And if we only address the sin and ignore the root issue, then the sin will probably be repeated. See, David, do you know how hard it is? I, I, I understand exactly how hard it is. I've got brothers and sisters. I've got nieces and nephews. I do. And I love them. But when God puts it on your heart, and, and he'll give you the words, and you're not going to go in there and just you know, beat them up with your Bible. I'm not saying that. But you go in there, and there's be a time and place that you can say a word to help them, not to harm them, not to damage them. You know, we have to be careful. And, and, and I've been accused of this before in my own life because I, I was so, you know, be, don't bruise the fruit. We're there to help pluck it, not bruise it up. Don't beat it up. But you can love them with the Word of God and tell them the truth and still address their need. Reuben's costly sin was lust. But Simeon and Levi were guilty of anger and violence in their unrestrained massacre of the Shechemites. The first point we talked about was how that Jacob denounces their sin. That's back in verse 5. He says they are brothers of cruelty. He's talking about how they have this bent. And when he, when he separates them, he says, Simeon and Levi, he says, you're not like the other brothers. He says, you guys feed off each other. He says, you're, you're cruel. He says, you have this bent inside of you. They were blood brothers to Dinah. But yet Jacob named Simeon first as the leader. And remember that it was Joseph who first bound Simeon when he sent the other brothers back to bring back Benjamin. He says, unless you bring the youngest one, he says, I will not, you know, I'll keep him in jail. So he put Simeon in jail. So why do you think he did that? Because he was probably the ringleader. He was probably one that, that could, you know, he intimidated them, he bullied them so they would do what he wanted to do. He was that cruel. Then he says they were instruments of cruelty. Their cruelty was just for sport. They had no regard for life. It was unbridled self-indulgence. They had hardened hearts. And he says this was their lifestyle. He says their instruments of cruelty, he says, are in their dwelling places. This is how they lived. And what Proverbs 1, we read verses 10 through 16. Stay away from these kinds of people, Solomon said. But they were probably thinking, you know, it's been 43 years. Surely dad has forgotten you know, right now he's on his deathbed and, you know, he's going to come in there and he's going to give us our inheritance. And so this is, this is going to be okay. And their justification was, you know, back then, 43 years ago, we were young. And besides that, it was our sister that was hurt. But Jacob says, no, you're brothers. You're not like my other children. Then Jacob comes in verse 6. He begins to separate himself from them. Their sin was not one of weakness like Reuben. Their sin was one of deliberate wickedness. Let not my soul enter their counsel. They were deceitful. They were spitefully cruel. And, and it comes down and, and, and it says at, at the bottom of verse 6, And in their self-will, because they wanted to, they hamstrung an ox. I mentioned the King James says they dig down a wall. But a lot of the translations have it. They said that they hamstrung an ox. They were just being cruel. They were, they were shepherds. They weren't farmers, so they didn't need an ox. And so they said, well, you know what, we'll just... And they probably just walked by and just took a, their hatchet and just took the tendon off the back of the oxen, just being cruel, being mean. But even though their father had reprimanded them, what's happening now is this is God's reprimand. Even though it happened 43 years ago, God says, no, we're, we're going to deal with it now because it's time. So the line has been drawn in verse 6 and 7. Jacob has the moral courage to rebuke them. Again, he says, let not my soul enter into their counsel. And you know what he's saying is when he says my soul, he says me personally, my honor, my integrity, my character. I will not be involved in their company. I will have nothing to do with them. Nothing to do with them. And you say, well, that, that sounds kind of harsh. If you go back and read Proverbs 1, verses 6 through 10 again, it's very plain what Solomon is telling us to do. Don't go with those who enjoy shedding blood. Don't go with those who are doing wrong. Don't go with those who want to just be cruel and mean and, and pick on people and bully people. And they want just to go and take things because they can. Jacob says, I will have nothing to do with you. That's what, those are harsh words. Harsh words. I, I can think back in my own life that there were times when when someone that I would be, I would consider a friend that I would hang out with, and, and all of a sudden they would do something that was just horrible, and I'd say, you know, I'm done. I'm not, we're, we're not friends anymore. 
And they would laugh and thought that was funny. But the next time they tried to get me to do something with them, I wouldn't, I'd ignore them. You say, why would you do that? I said, because I just, you know, I was, I'd just been saved. And I said, I am not going to be involved in this. I, I do, I'm not going to live that way. So I'm just going to stay away from them. So but you lost a good friend. Yeah, I probably did. But I didn't have all the guilt and other stuff that he would lead me into. Because he had a lot of influence in my life. But I just had to get away from him. It was not good. Let not my soul... Then he says, I am not with them, nor will I associate with them. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, not only let not my soul enter their council, let not my honor be united to their assembly. He said, I don't even want to have anything associated with you. I don't run with your assembly. I'm not with your crowd, is what he's saying. He said, well, David, he's, he's, he's 100 and, you know, and, and 40 some years old. He, he's getting ready to die, you know. He said, don't you think this is a bit much? No, this is what he was probably teaching them all along and they never heard it. We have to draw the line, ladies and gentlemen. Even with its family. You say, really? We have to. Why? You're not helping them. You have to think about the, 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 what, what, what is the, the ultimate thing we have to be concerned about with all the, all the people in our lives. Their eternal destiny. And if we, if we miss that, then you know what? We failed them. We fail them if we're not going to be honest with them. If we're not going to tell them the truth. If we're not going to tell them about the Lord and Jesus and that what they're doing is not healthy, it's not good because of where it's going to eventually lead them to. Now, I, I know this is thin ice for people because, you know, we all have family and we always, you know, we got brothers and sisters and we got aunts and all, you know, and you got nieces and nephews and grandchildren and you think, you know, but, but David, I I, listen, I understand all that. I do. But when I look at this whole family of mine and I think about their eternal destinies, you know what? You got, sometimes we just got to take the gloves off and say, you know what? I, I'm going to have to tell them one more time about Jesus. One more time. They may roll their eyes and look at you and scoff and, and, you know, and say, you know, I'm glad that works for you. I could give you all that stuff. But you know what? Put all that aside. They need to, uh, I, you know, you say, well, I can't make them be saved, but I can tell them. One more time. And then the most important thing I can do is I have to live it so that they see that it works. That, that's important. In all of its imperfection. But notice what he does here. He curses their lust and their passion, but he doesn't curse their persons. How does he separate that? Hate the sin, love the sinner. Look with me in verse 6. He says, let not my soul enter their council, let not my honor be united to their assembly. Here it is. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed, verse 7, cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. What he's saying is, what you did was wrong. Cursed be that. Why? Why? That is an abomination that goes completely against what God has taught us and what we stand for as a family. But what does he do to them? He doesn't curse them, but he tells them what the consequences of their sin is going to be. And that's the rest of the verse. And we'll read it real quick because we're going to have to come back to it. He says, I will divide them in Jacob. He separated them from the other boys. And I will scatter them in Israel. We talked about it this morning. Just for, we mentioned it, the fact that they would not receive any allotment as far as of land tribal lands that was part of the curse upon them anger leads to wrath which leads to cruelty in their cruel assemblies a man could lose his life they only meet to plot evil schemes back over again to proverbs go back to proverbs one let's just look at that real quick proverbs chapter one won't read all of it Look at verse 10 and 11. I mean, here, here again, the Word of God gives us a guide. It gives us warnings. And it, it's just given us good common spiritual sense. Proverbs 1 verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. And then he keeps going. And then it, all the way down, he says, verse 14, Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. 
for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. Solomon is not saying, you know, don't go hang out with the boys and go around, you know, beat up mailboxes with baseball bats. He says, you need to stay away from these guys because they're going to kill people. They're going to shed blood. They're going to take lives. And, and, and that doesn't mean anything to them. It's almost like they have no conscience whatsoever. Stay away from them. And as hard as this was, Jacob must expose them and their deeds. Why? Because there are still ten other brothers, and now there's a whole bunch of nieces and nephews, especially the nephews. They need to hear this. Now, I mentioned this morning, think about Simeon. For 43 years, he and Levi have this, it wasn't a secret, they probably bragged about it when they had their little reunions. Oh yeah, remember that time dad? Yeah, granddad went down there, took out the Shechemites, boy, showed them, you know, and you know, family honor, we have to keep that. But you've got that, that mentality, you've got that bent, you've got that cruelty, it is being embedded in the lives of these sons and the other sons. Because it's okay. You know, we look up to that. It's almost like the, the gang stuff, you know. Gang initiations, all this stuff. So Jacob comes, now he pronounces their judgment. Back to 49. Listen to what he says, the last part of verse 7. I will divide them in Jacob. The places in the kingdom were not so final that grace would not intervene. It's not over yet. Levi is going to do something. We'll talk about that in a, moment, in a moment. But Simeon never did anything. Levi is going to have a change of heart, change of direction. And God's grace is going to be upon him. For their sin, there was a curse. Their lust, their sin, total disregard for man and beast. He said, I will divide them to Jacob. I will separate their tribes from the others. And they will have no standing. You know, it, the thing with, with Jacob, what he's doing is he's going to give them land and allot, allotments. He said, you will have this and you will have this. And then Moses and Joshua, when they go into the land, Simeon, he has such a small part that it, it's really, it's included on the bottom part of, of Judah and Benjamin. Because the tribe of Simeon is about to disappear. And of course, you know about the Levites. They had no land at all. But they were given responsibilities. They were living in 48 different cities. But they were given the task because of God's grace. That tells us that there was repentance and confession. That they were going to teach God's law. Now imagine that. They know how to teach God's law because they know their heritage. Let me tell you what our great, 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 great grandfather did. Yeah, he was mean and cruel and hateful and went in and, and slaughtered this village. He said, I will scatter them in Israel. Turn to Hosea. Chapter 8, verse 7. I don't, Charles, I don't think that was on the list. Hosea, chapter 8, verse 7. You know this verse. We say it all the time, but here's the address. Hosea 8, 7. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no bud. It shall never produce meal. If it should produce, aliens will swallow it up. They sow the wind. They will reap the whirlwind. You go to Galatians. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. That's what they're doing. Jacob is, Jacob is speaking on behalf of God here in Genesis 49. Simeon's tribe, I already mentioned, they will be absorbed into the tribe of Judah. Now watch this. Turn to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. Here's where we see that God gave all of the tribes an opportunity to do the right thing, and Levi steps up. In chapter 32, Moses is up on the mount, and in his absence, you know the story, Aaron, the people become restless, and so he says, they start saying, why don't we go back to Egypt? You know, Moses hasn't come back, maybe something happened to him, so you got all this drama going on, so it's, it's amazing, and this is, I mean, it's, it's comical, but it's sad. <laughs> So Moses comes down, he thinks there's either a war going on, no, nope, they're having a party. And he gets down there and there's all kinds of things going on and this golden calf is sitting there and they're running around and they're worshiping the golden calf. And so remember what Moses said? Moses said, you know, I'm, I'm adding this. What, how'd this get here? I don't know. He said, everybody gave us their earrings and stuff and we threw it in fire and out jumped this golden calf. <laughs> Read it, it's in there. This, this calf just, poof, just jumped out. There it is, golden calf. Let's worship it. It's a god. It's a golden calf. 
So Moses is furious. So look with me in verse 26 of chapter 32. Well, I'll tell you what, go back to verse 24. Some of you don't think I knew what I'm talking about. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. There it is. Boom, golden calf. Don't you wish, guys, you could go home and just throw some stuff in the oven, and out jumps a turkey dinner? It doesn't work that way. I know. I, I promise you. All right, 26. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. They put their swords and they went out and there was judgment time in the camp. Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And the tribe of Levi came. Levi took a stand for God. The Levites responded and Levi would profit from this judgment. But Simeon did not. We won't look at all the scriptures, but in Exodus 38, the Levites were given leadership roles in the tabernacle, and when it came to the temple in 1 Chronicles, they were involved in the temple worship. Now, do you know some names of some Levites? How about Moses? How about Phinehas? You remember Phinehas? This is over in Numbers 25. He's chiefly known for that incident. The people had fallen into sexual immorality with the women of Moab, the women of Moab had invited them to come and sacrifice to their gods, and they were into maybe sacrifices and all kinds of evil things. And as a result, the judgment of God came and fell upon them in the form of a plague, and it followed on the people. But Phinehas was furious. He was a Levite. He was furious and offended by the wickedness. So when he saw Zimri, Z-I-M-R-I, a member of the tribe of Simeon, take a Moabite woman into his tent, he took a spear and he killed both of them with it. And because of this, the plague was stopped and God praised Phinehas for his zeal and blessed his family. Eli, the old priest of Shiloh, was 98 years old. He judged Israel for 40 years. And then there's one last one. His name is John the Baptist. Did you know that he was a Levite? Okay. And I believe we have a Levite in our congregation tonight. And he's sitting back there with the headphones on. His name is Gary Cohn. In his lineage, he is a Levite, okay? So y'all be nice with him, all right? Just you know, work with him. John the Baptist. Levites would receive 48 cities to live in. They would serve as the high priest and serve in the Lord's house. But their portion would always be the Lord. Imagine that. They didn't have any land, didn't have any property. But God told them because of their faithfulness, when they started, when they stood with Moses... At Bel Peor, God says, I will be your portion. And you know what? That's our portion. You know, I don't need stuff. I need Jesus. I, I don't need, I don't, I just, I need him. And, you know, here's the thing. When you have Jesus, you've got everything you need. And I'm not talking about stuff. I have him. That's what I need. You can't buy peace. You can't buy joy. You can't buy forgiveness. You can't buy a clear conscience. You can't buy any of that. But you can find it in Christ. So, what about Simeon? We mentioned this. Simeon was absorbed into the tribe of Judah, but this meant that even in the bad days of Jeroboam and his successor, Simeon was together with Judah and Benjamin. He was kept from the general apostasy because in 722, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, remember they split after um, Solomon and, the, and Rehoboam and all those. Okay, so the ten tribes, they're taken away in 722. But 135 years later, around 586, 585, the southern tribe was taken away in apostasy. So Simeon was with that group, with Judah and Benjamin. And that was just the goodness and, and grace of God. So let, let me close with this. And this is, this is important. I read out of, out of Joel the fact that, that God will come. Let me find that verse for you again. I want to read it. Joel 2.13 so rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? Who knows? So the point is this. If for some reason, and this happens, if you 
are the victim of someone else's sin and you're suffering or if you're suffering because of something self-inflicted your guilt is overwhelming you even to the place of paralyzing you please hear if you're suffering from sin draw near to God and find that he is far more ready to forgive you than you are to come to him See, God wants to help us, and listen now, this is important, because He wants to. You say, well, He has to, He's God. No, 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 listen to me. He wants to. Jesus Christ came to a sin-cursed world. He who knew no sin became sin for you and me. It was, it's, like, it's a picture of the Old Testament. When they would bring, their, their, say, a, a, a sacrifice of a lamb... And the, and the priest would hold the lamb, probably by a, a leash, and he would hand you the knife, because this is your lamb, and you would put your hands on the head of the lamb, and you would confess your sins, and then you would take the knife, and you would take the lamb's life. You would take, cut the throat of the lamb. And that lamb became your sacrifice. And, that, and your sins were laid upon that lamb. Isaiah 53. Our iniquity, our sins were laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Laid upon him. When he went to the cross, all of our sins, now all, I'm talking about the whole world, past, Old Testament, New Testament, until Jesus returns, all of that sin was placed upon him at the cross. And on the cross, the wrath of God fell upon Jesus. The wrath of God that you and I deserved in judgment for our sinfulness because of our sins. Because of our rebellion. All of that. So when we place our faith and trust in Christ, what we're saying is, Lord Jesus, I believe that you took my place on the cross. You took my sins upon yourself at the cross. And you died for me. The wages of sin is what? We know that. Death. Death. So Jesus died. Was that the end of the story? No. Three days later, the last enemy called death was defeated in the resurrection. So Jesus not only took our sin upon himself, but he defeated the last enemy called death in the resurrection. And then, 50 days later, he ascends. 40 days later, he ascends into heaven. 10 days later, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, came that he told the disciples who were terrified that he was leaving because if he's not present, then it's over. No more miracles, nothing. But he said, I'm going to send you a comforter, and when he comes, he will remind you of everything that I taught you. And they didn't get that until Pentecost. And then Peter, the misfit of all the disciples, he stands up. Remember, he denied Jesus. He did all these things. He's going fishing. Jesus meets him. He restores him. On Pentecost, who's the guy that stands up and proclaims the gospel? Peter. So what does that mean to us? It means that God is not through with any of us. And that he wants us to be a spokesperson for him. And tell them the good news. One of the things that Peter said, this same Jesus whom you have crucified is both Lord and Savior. 3,000 people get saved. Glory to God. Wouldn't you like to be something like that? Boom! Here they are. New hearts. Changed. Instead of fighting over seats, they're loving each other. Take my seat. I mean, it's amazing. And all they did was share the gospel. That's what he did, Pentecost. Got Jews from all around the world came together. And you, you know, the tongues are on the head and, and, and they're listening and people are hearing all the, the gospel in their different language. God does that. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved from your sins. The wrath we deserve was placed on him. He died so we could live. That's, a, that's, that's simple, isn't it? But why is it so hard for us to tell people that? Huh. 
because there's an enemy out there and he doesn't like us and he doesn't want us talking about those things so he's going to do everything he can to trip us up make us nervous help us lose confidence and, and, and help us to lose our courage and so that we won't say these things but I tell you you know how do you David what do you do I'm telling you as, as, as terrified as I was I can remember the first time I told Sandy that I loved her I, I was going to die and I thought if she laughs at me I'm going to even go crazy you know and I said she's going to miss she's going to think I'm a nut you know and, and I remember when I told her that, she looked at me with those blue eyes, and I just thought, I mean, I, I become as dumb as a rock. But I was going to tell her, because she needed to know that, because I didn't want her to get away. We need, to fall, we need to be madly in love with people all around us, and I don't want them to go to eternity without Jesus. And here's what you have to understand. You say, well, I, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to say it right. Don't you worry about what you're going to say. You let the Spirit of God give you those words. And He will. And you'll say exactly what they need to hear. And you say, well, that sounded so goofy. No, 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 no. That's exactly what they needed to hear. And God will take that word because it's the Holy Spirit. And He will put it in their heart. And you know what? All He needs us, <laughs> He just needs us to speak. You know, if God can use a donkey, we've got a good chance here. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, we can do it. We can do it. Say, so, Lord, I'm going to make a fool of myself. Paul said, I'm a fool for Christ. I mean, who better to be a fool for? Amen? All right, guys. Let's pray. Father, break the chains of sin from our past, from our family heritage. Break those chains. And you've broken them in Jesus. You've set us free. You've given us the power of God, as Peter talks about, because you have changed us. You've given us a new nature. Lord, help us not to just stop there. Help us to keep growing in our faith, in our knowledge of you. And Lord, especially when it comes to our heart. Enlarge our heart. Fill it with love for everyone around us. It's not about color. It's not about where they sit in society. It's not about what their past sin may be. And God, I pray that as we stay close and clean, that you would put people in our path, people of peace who are looking for the answers as they too face their eternity. God, you work in their hearts, you work in our hearts, and that divine appointment will take place. And God, we can share the good news of Jesus. And help us not to be surprised or shocked. Help us to be filled with joy, just like the disciples. <laughs> they were arrested, they were beaten, and they rejoiced because they had been punished because they loved Jesus. That's not a bad thing. Mocked because we love Jesus. Oh, God, help us to push all the societal fears aside and help us to be faithful to the Son because He is faithful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Barry? Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam, farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today.
before you leave, I want everybody to smile. It takes more muscles to smile than it does to frown. So you got to work at it. Okay? If Miss Jean Rowe was here, she would be my object lesson. I think she was born smiling. Why do I want you to smile? Because Jesus saves. And he will save to the uttermost. Now you want to lose translation? He'll go get the bad ones. Because some of us were those. Amen? He saves us to the uttermost. All right? So let's pray for one another that God's going to give us the courage and the opportunity. But we have to wait on him. All right? We don't need spiritual bull and closets, guys. I mean, well, we, need, we need people who are going to be led by the Spirit of God. He's going to give us the Word of God, and we can share the good news. Okay? All right? Got it? Amen. Jonathan and Ashley, thank you so much for being with us today. We're going to be praying for your self, 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 self return. How else are you going to get on? Your safe return. And uh, we're praying for God's will to be done in your lives and in ours as well. Amen? Church, let's give them a round of applause to encourage them. So, all right. Mr. Hollingsworth, would you close us in prayer tonight, sir?